This is CNN. I'm Jim Moray in Los Angeles. The preliminary hearing, day four, set to resume again after this uh, lunch break, just about four minutes from now. In the meantime, what's happened today, primarily the uh, hearing has focused on the defense motion to suppress evidence. That means to throw out certain evidence that the police obtained at O.J. Simpson's house at a search at that residence before obtaining a search warrant. Two detectives were on the stand once again today, Detective Mark Furman of the LAPD and the lead investigator, Detective Philip Van Adder. They were sparring with defense counsel Robert Shapiro, uh, Detective Van Adder in particular, talking about whether the search was reasonable. When you scale the fence, you believe that there may be hostages inside. Is that correct? I believe there may be a whole set of circumstances. Well, let's, let's take them one by one. Was one of the set of circumstances you believe that there would be hostages inside? I can't, I can't answer that yes or no. There could have been a thousand scenarios of that situation. And you can't the tell facts, us. may I finish, sir? The facts that lead me up to going over the wall included a set of facts that believe me, that led me to believe that this was an emergency situation. Can you tell us whether or not you believe there was a hostage situation, yes or no? That could have been a possibility, yes. And if there was a hostage situation, would you notify communications for backup? If I, if I was totally aware of that, that would, that would change the entire circumstances of that entry into that location. What you're talking about is you're taking a, a tactical field situation in equating it to an emergency field situation, which is two different set of circumstances. Did you believe that there was the possibility of people at the residence or on the grounds bleeding to death? That was a possibility, yes. If you truly believed that, would you call communications and ask for paramedics? Not until I made sure that that was a safe location, no. If you were concerned about your safety, would you go in with backup units? Definitely. Did you go in with backup units? No. If you were concerned about your safety, would you go in with vest? Definitely. Did you go in with vest? No. If you were concerned about your safety, would you go in with weapons drawn? If I was, yes. Did you go in with weapons drawn? No. Uh, I see that court appears to be back in session. Let's listen in. We have the detective back on the stand. Detective Philip Van Adder. Detective Van Etter, um, I'm kind of curious. You said that you were very surprised by a maid not being there on the property. Um, and that you didn't, on cross-examination, I think you indicated that you uh, did not consider the possibility that uh, she would have some days off. Did you expect someone to always be on that property? Well, from the appearance of the property with lights on and vehicles parked there, yes, I thought someone was there. And when you say vehicles parked there, you mean the one on Rockingham, the Bronco outside? Well, that as well as two other vehicles that were parked inside the compound in the driveway, which would be on the uh, Rockingham Drive. There were multiple vehicles inside the driveway? There were two other vehicles that I could see, yes. And you could see that from the Ashford Gate? <laughs> well, no, I, I saw that from the uh, Rockingham Gate. When I, when I walked over to that area, I could see it. When you walked over and you were looking at the Bronco? That's correct, You yes. could see through that gate? Yes. <laughs> Can you show us on that defense diagram where you saw those other cars? Certainly. The vehicles were parked up in this area here, which is the little jut out that looked like a parking area for vehicles. And looking through the gate, you could see the vehicles parked there. For the record, the witness has pointed to an area that is actually just above what's marked at the word driveway on the diagram that is the southernmost portion of the property. Okay. Sir, counsel was asking you about um, using the uh, chronolog forms. Yes. 
What is the difference between a blank piece of paper and the form that you use for your chronological log? Nothing except there's lines on the chronological log and there's a heading that says chronological log. So the difference between a blank page and the chronolog form is horizontal lines and a heading? Yes. What information uh, is usually required to be on a chronological log? When you make an entry, what are you supposed to put in that entry? The, the entries are mainly very general entries as to, as to the day and quite possibly the time that you make a follow-up, but you never put the information that you, re, uh, that you receive from that on the log. That just records what you did, not the results of what you did. Exactly. And you, did you look at the, the uh, chronological log that's been uh, compiled so far in this case? When it was in front of me, yes. Okay. What information, what is the difference between what you've got on these blank pages written down in the chronological log than you would have had on the form with the lines on it? There would be no difference. So you've got the same information on this chronolog that you would have had had you used the form with the horizontal lines and a heading? Yes. Now, the photographs of the Bronco. I wonder if I could inquire of the clerk. Um, do we have the defense exhibits here? I have could, could you bring them? Thank you. How many pictures of the Ford Bronco in its position on the street were taken, sir? I don't know. More than one? Several, I would say, yes. Do you remember what each and every one of them look like right now? <clears throat> no, I do not. You, you, you requested the criminalist to make sure that photographs were taken of that Bronco. I think yes. You, you so testified. What was your intention with respect to taking those photographs of the Bronco? To document uh, any, uh, any evidence in the uh, location of the vehicle and the identity of the vehicle. Exhibit F. Do you recognize what's shown there, sir? Yes, I do. What is it? It's uh, four pictures labeled one through four of different um, different uh, perspectives of the same vehicle, the Ford uh, Bronco. Okay, and showing you defense exhibit C. Do you recognize what's shown there? Yes, I do. What's shown there? That's the Ford Bronco. The west wall and uh, Rockingham uh, gate to uh, Mr. Simpson's uh, residence. Looking at those photographs, sir, the defense counsel, I think, asked you whether the pictures taken of the Ford Bronco at your direction through the criminalist were accurate pictures of the position of that car as you saw it on Rockingham. Do you recall that question, sir? Yes. With respect to whether or not the car had been moved from the position in which you first observed it, is, that, is it the case that the car was not moved before those photographs were taken? The car was not moved. Can you see in those photographs the angle that you've described for us earlier with the rear end jutting out a little bit, appearing to have been parked in haste. Yes, I can. Show us where. If you look at pictures number two and number four, it shows the front wheel of the vehicle to be setting actually on the paved curb section, part of the paved <coughs> curb section and the asphalt and the back wheel, the passenger side to be strictly on the asphalt farther west than the front wheel. And are either of the wheels up next to the curb? No, they are not.
I think you earlier indicated that um, at some point you saw the children leaving the house. Yes. Do you recall what transpired in terms of arranging for their care and custody while you were in the house on 360 Rockingham? Yes, I do. Can you please tell us? After Detective Lang had a conversation with Mr. Simpson, uh, Mr. Simpson had indicated to Detective Lang that he wished the children to be with his daughter, Arnell. She was notified of that, <coughs> contacted Al Cowlings. He responded to the location, and they went to West Los Angeles Division and picked up the children. Do you know when the children arrived at 360 Rockingham with Al Callings? I know approximately. It would have been uh, around, I believe, around 7 o'clock in the morning. And how long after, it, after that did you determine that the area should be sealed for the purpose of securing a search warrant? I, I, I had actually come to that conclusion a little earlier than that. Uh, I was waiting for the criminalists to respond there to do a presumptive blood test for me, and after that was done was when I, when I closed down the area and secured the area. And you closed down, do you remember what time it was approximately when you secured the area? It would have, it would have been between 7 and 7.30, I left the location approximately 7.30, so it was before I left there. So it would have been some time in a range of probably 7.10 to 7.15, something like that. Shortly after Al Cowlings got there with the children? Yes. Council asked you on cross-examination uh, about tactical support, I think it was mentioned. With respect to, in that instance, uh, the effort made to take the defendant into custody. Do you recall that question, sir? Yes, I do. How was that situation different from the one that you found confronting you at 360 Rockingham in the early morning hours of June 13th? Well, a tactical situation is totally different from the situation we were facing there. I believe this to be an emergency situation which requires, I felt, action to be taken. A tactical situation is if you have a location that you know you have a suspect, a hostage, or whatever, if these are known facts, you immediately request uniform to respond, you notify a supervisor, detectives are required to put on vests and what we call raid jackets, Los Angeles police raid jackets that readily identify us as police officers. This was not this situation at all. This situation was something that I felt was an emergency that needed to be handled immediately. And in this situation, did you believe that you had, did you believe that you were pursuing a, a suspect into the residence at 360 Rockingham? I, I really didn't know what I was pursuing in there. I, I, I had no specific suspect in mind at that point. My main feeling at that point, coupled with all the information I had, was this was a situation that someone could be injured. We could have another, another murder scene. We could have a murder-suicide scene. We could have people that needed assistance. And that was my feeling. So would it be fair to say, sir, that you were concerned not so much for your safety, but for the safety of someone else you might find inside the compound? Sustained. Were you concerned for officer safety at the moment you decided to go over the wall? Not at all. I, I wouldn't have let anybody enter that location the way we were with that if, uh, if I felt there was a safety problem at that time. Well, if you were concerned for someone else's safety, sir, why didn't you call an ambulance right, right then, before you went over the wall? I would never call an ambulance until an area has been cleared and secured. Uh, I don't want to bring someone else in that could be in danger. Uh, I wouldn't do that.
So until you found out what you had back there, you were not about to call an ambulance? No, not, not until I assessed the situation and actually knew what I was dealing with. Uh, at that point, again, I didn't really know what I was dealing with. I, was, uh, I had certain knowledge that gave me a feeling that this was an emergency situation and something that had to be dealt with immediately. And, uh, and at that point, I, I didn't know whether I had people down. I didn't know whether I had, again, another scene, someone injured. Uh, I didn't know. Okay, they are questioning right now Detective Philip Van Adder of the LAPD. Marsha Clark, the prosecutor, is redirecting her examination. The prosecution is trying to show that the LAPD search of O.J. Simpson's house on the morning uh, after the murders was a reasonable one, even though no search warrant was obtained until several hours after certain evidence was obtained from O.J. Simpson's house. Hear, sir, about, uh the method in which Ronald Goldman was notified, how long it took to do that. You mean the family of Mr. Goldman? That's correct. I'm yes. sorry. Thank you. And when you arrived at the crime scene at about 4 a.m., were you aware of the identity of the male victim who was found near Nicole Simpson? No. Was anyone, to your knowledge, at the crime scene aware of his identity? No. At what point was his identity made known to you? I actually found out his identity while I was at West Los Angeles Station. It would have been somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock that uh, the coroner's representatives had responded to the location and they had identified him from identification that was on him. So when the coroner's investigator arrived and found identification on him, that's when his identity was determined? That's correct. Do you know what time that was approximately? Well, I got I got notification uh, while I was at West LA Division. That was it would have it would have been after ten o'clock, I'm sure. Then. With respect to, let's say for a moment that you knew that there was a suspect in. 360 Rockingham Avenue. What would you have done? Objection, house respect. Not, this is an expert witness, Your Honor, who knows he's describing actually the distinction between the situation he was confronted with and that about which he was questioned by Mr. Shapiro. All right, are you asking how he would have handled it differently if he was pursuing a suspect and he knew he was pursuing a suspect before he entered the premises? Yes, Your Honor. All right, the objections overruled. Well, that would have become a tactical situation then. I would have, I would have made noti uh, notification to the West Los Angeles watch commander, requested uniforms to respond to the location. I would have placed officers around the residence to secure the residence. I would have had the detectives there put on vests and raid jackets, and I would have uh, contacted probably our Metropolitan Division to have uh, special negotiators come out and try and talk the suspect out of the location. And nothing further. Mr. Shapiro? Yes, sir. <coughs> Detective, regarding the Ford Bronco, at some point in time, did that vehicle have some evidentiary value in and of itself? Yes. When did you determine it had evidentiary value? After looking at all of the scene that I saw there, and uh, as it began to lighten up that morning after seeing the blood trail in the driveway, I could see into the vehicle and see additional blood inside the vehicle, and at that point it became a a very important evidentiary item. What time was that? 
probably around the t uh, right after I saw the blood trail in the uh, driveway. What time was that? Uh, that would have been, a, again, I will have to estimate, that would have probably been around 6.45 to 7 o'clock, something like that. And what steps did you take to secure that vehicle and preserve the evidence? I instructed the detectives that the vehicle was to be impounded, it was to be guarded, and I told the criminalist who responded at 7.10 that it was of evidentiary value to, to, uh, to photograph, obtain any items of evidence that he could from the outside, and, uh, and to protect the vehicle. Were your instructions followed? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Did you have any reports that the media surrounded the car, they couldn't keep the media away from it, and coffee cups were put on the car and coffee spilled? No, sir, I was not aware of that. What do you mean by securing the premises? In uh, what context? It's a term you use. You used that all this morning. Secured the, I secured the premises. What do you mean by that? Well, in a, in a literal sense, that's a police term that's used. In a literal sense, it can mean a couple of things. What did you mean by it when you used it this morning? I'll, Okay, what I, what I meant this morning is a check of the location to make sure that everything's okay, that there's no forced entry into the home, that there's nobody injured, that there's nobody down, or nobody in need of assistance. What time did you make that determination, that the residence was secure? What time did I make the determination that it was secure? That again would have been, I believe, after walking back outside and being notified that Mr. Simpson was in Chicago, that he had been talked to and that he was en route back to Los Angeles, that the maid was not present at the location, and that nobody else was found there. And that would have been probably 6.45 to 7 in the morning. You later determined that the bedrooms for the house itself, not the guest bedrooms, but the main bedrooms were on the second story, did you not? Yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Ms. Clark, anything else? Okay, we're going to take a short break in these proceedings. We'll be back with more on the O.J. Simpson preliminary hearing right after well, this. Well, Detective Van Adder, if you were concerned... On the outside? Yes. Did you see anything that drew your attention? Yes, as, uh, as I walked closer and I got oriented to where this noise probably came from, I looked down and I saw a dark object. I was probably still... 15, 20 feet away, and I kept walking closer, and then I saw when I was a few feet away that it was a glove. Now, when you went back there, what were you actually looking for? What were you I, expecting to find? Well, I thought somebody had collapsed back there. So you looking for a body? Yes. Were you a series of photographs that have been marked as people's nine? Do you recognize the location? shown in photographs A, B, C, and D? Yes, I do. And what is that location? Uh, this is the, uh, the walkway. I would be looking east from the, from the front of the residence. I don't know how deep this lens makes it appear, but this would what I would be viewing from the front of the residence, looking directly east down the south border path of the residence. And in B? B is, is just a, a closer, a closer uh, view of the same item. This dark object is the, the glove I discovered. C? C is, once again, a very close view in the condition of the surrounding uh, walkway. And D. D is a very close-up view of the glove. When you saw that glove, did it have some significance to you? 
Yes, it looked very similar to the glove that I observed on Bundy uh, hours before. And based on that observation, sir, what did you do? I looked at it a little closer. I noted that it uh, did not match the terrain. As you can see, that there's a, a lot of dirt and leaves. This glove was not dirty in the least. It looked uh, a little sticky and moist. Two fingers were stuck to the, uh, to the glove. It looked like it was stuck there with some type of a liquid. I didn't touch it. I went past the air conditioning duct that you can see in photo A. And as soon as I went past that air conditioning duct, looking for the person that might have dropped this glove, thinking that they were farther down the walkway, I ran into spider webs immediately. Which indicated what to you? I would say nobody had walked on that path um, lately or recently, especially within hours, where I, re I encountered no spider webs going up to the glove. Only after the glove? Only after the glove. Having made those observations, sir, what did you do next? I continued all the way east on this path, and then there was a uh, probably 25, squ 25 square foot area that looked it looked like a, a plant potting area or maybe a place where they make they start plants to uh, put on the property. And I, I looked for any evidence uh, of blood or or a victim that had collapsed. Uh, I found that there was none, and, and I returned to uh, the uh, location and notified uh, Detective uh, Phillips of the find. The find being? The glove. Did, uh, did then uh, Ron, uh, Ron Phil Detective Phillips, uh, Detective Lang, Detective Van Adder go out to look at the glove as well? Individually, I took uh, each one of them down to where I had found the glove, <clears throat> indicating what I saw as I went and uh, what I did. Uh, I took Detective Phillips first, Detective Van Adder second, and Detective Lang third. If you know, sir, do you recall um at what point a criminalist was called for to come to 360 Rockingham? <clears throat> you mean what time did he arrive? No. Do you recall, do you happen to know when he was called? I don't have specific knowledge. I did not make any notifications on this. At some point, did one arrive? Yes. And do you recall when that was? I couldn't give you an exact, I, I'd say 8, 7.30, 8.00. 8.30, I'm not positive. At some time after the glove was located, uh, were you uh, requested to secure the house for the purpose of getting a search warrant? Yes, almost uh, immediately after the discovery of the glove, uh, within, within minutes, uh, Detective Van Adder said, this is now a crime scene. Seal it, I'm going to go write a warrant. And seal it means what? Uh, protect the evidence that has already been discovered. Uh, keep everybody out of the house. Ask the people that are in the house to please leave if they're not necessary personnel. And to protect the premises. And was that done? Yes. Now, at the time in the house, do you recall who was there inside? I can remember uh, Mr. Cowlings was there, but I can't remember exactly what time he was asked to leave. I believe it, it, it was shortly after we uh, decided that we had to write a search warrant for this residence. Uh, so I don't know specifically when he was asked to leave. Arnell was asked to leave uh, the property. I, bu I'm, I believe Arnell uh, contacted Mr. Cowlings, but I'm not sure on that. I have no. So, to the best of your knowledge, by the time the decision was made to get to secure the house and get a search warrant, Arnell was there, A.C. Collings was there. I believe so, yes. Okay. Did
Did you see any children there? Yes, and I don't know how that, I don't know whose children they were, and I don't know how that transpired. But they were all there at the time the decision was made to uh, get the search warrant? Yes. Okay, this is significant testimony right here. You're listening to Detective Mark Furman of the LAPD. He's a homicide investigator, the uh, investigator who actually scaled the uh, fence at O.J. Simpson's mansion following the discovery of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's body. All right, we are going to take uh, the afternoon recess. We'll take a 15-minute break at this time and start again just after 3.05. Okay, we are going right back into the courtroom. Uh, the um, brief uh, recess is over. Let's go back, listen to Detective Mark Furman, LAPD homicide investigator, on the stand as the defense gets well, ready Detective to cross-examine. did you uh, ever prepare any reports regarding your participation in this investigation? No, I just took some uh, preliminary notes uh, while I was still at the scene before robbery homicide detectives arrived. All right, and uh, what did you do with those notes? I gave them to Detective Phillips, and they were in turn given to Detective Van Adder and Lang. And uh, what did uh, Detective Van Adder do with them? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. Uh, were they utilized in preparing any reports by uh, Detective Van Adder that you're I, aware of? Excuse me. I have no idea, sir. Did you review any reports prepared by Detective Van Adder? No, none. Now, actually, you were the first uh, homicide detective to arrive at the scene at 875 South Bundy. Is that correct? Yes, myself and Detective Phillips. You both arrived at the same time? Yes, we were riding together. So you actually met at the station and then went to the scene? Yes, we, we met at the station, got uh, flashlights or briefcases, anything else we thought we might need, got into a, a vehicle that had homicide kit in it, and uh, went to the scene. All right. Now, ordinarily, uh, the homicide detective then takes charge of the investigation. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned that at some point, uh, uh, Detective Van Adder and his partner took over the investigation? Yes, sir. Why did that happen? <clears throat> I believe uh, it was told to me that Chief Frankel uh, was notified of the VIP nature of the homicide and uh, determined that it was beyond the scope of our abilities to handle it in a geographic division and notified Robbery Homicide Division to respond with detectives to take over the, uh, the investigation. Okay, so the, the VIP division was called in to take over the investigation? No, it's uh, any, any uh, type of a murder that will generate more logistical support than we're able to uh, produce. Uh, robbery Homicide has a latitude of funneling a lot of people on an investigation and stick with it where we still have cases that come up daily or weekly uh, that would interrupt a, a large-scale investigation such as this. And that uh, decision was made based on the identification of the victim as uh, Nicole Brown? To the best of my Jackson, knowledge, that sir. Calls for speculation. Well, what time was that decision made? When were you informed that... Objection uh, irrelevant. Mr. Ullman, you can finish your question. What time were you informed that Detective Van Hatter and uh, Detective Lang were taking over the case? I would probably say within an hour of my arrival. Right. Had uh, Detective Van Hatter or Detective Lang arrived at the scene yet when you were informed of that? No, I believe they arrived at, uh, Van Hatter arrived at approximately 4, and I believe uh, Detective Lang arrived at about 4.25. Now, when you arrived, uh, had the scene already been secured? Yes, sir. Uh, could you describe what uh, securing the scene means? What, what does that term mean? Well, the, the streets were closed off at Dorothy and Bundy, the street uh, to the north, one block to the north, the alleys to the rear had been secured, the front of the residence. Uh, there was no traffic going northbound on Bundy from Dorothy. 
The residents had been secured with officers to the rear, officers to the front. There was a uniformed sergeant at the scene. I believe, uh, I believe there were six officers that were at the scene. Uh, it was secured with uh, crime tape. The police do not cross tape, the yellow tape, at all those locations. So essentially, uh, securing a scene means that it is totally blocked off uh, so that no one other than the officers in charge uh, have access to the scene. Is that correct? Yes, we, we try to preserve it as much as possible. And uh, I believe you indicated that uh, rather than walk through the, the scene or the, the portion of the scene where the victims were located, uh, in order not to disturb that, you walk, you went around to the back? Yes, it, the, the scene didn't appear that it would have been feasible to try to dodge evidence or the, the blood of the victim victims. Uh, we had to go around. It was too much of a, a jockey of a, too much of a balancing act to try to get around. That it wasn't necessary. We could have entered from the rear. Now, when you went to the rear, uh, you indicated you went in through the garage? Yes. The garage door was open? Yes. Had that been opened by officers, or was it open at the time they arrived at the scene? I'm not positive on how it was opened or who opened it. I know that the officers uh, got it open through the switch inside, and I'm not know how, I do not know how that uh, took place. Uh, I was informed that one of the, uh, uh, I believe one of the children showed the officer where the switch was, and I'm not positive on that. So you actually went in through the house then uh, and approached the, the crime scene from the rear? I went in uh, from the garage, walked uh, next to the white Ferrari that was parked in the garage, and the uh, door to the lower level of the house was open. Uh, I walked directly into a stairway, and I entered, and that uh, placed me inside a the kitchen. Okay. From the kitchen you went out uh, to the walkway beside the condo? Well I was I was walking rather slowly. I was I was looking around. Although Officer Risky was leading us into this, showing us the scene from what he discovered, uh, we're walking slow and we're looking for anything that uh, would appear to be evidence or something that could possibly be evidence. And then yes we did walk from the interior to the exterior of the front door. Uh, now, at this point, it was still dark outside? Yes. Uh, had any been lights been set up to illuminate the, uh, the scene of the homicide? No. The uh, lights from the open front door were cascading down onto the, to the uh, two victims, um, onto the, the stairway. All right. And uh, I believe you, you indicated that you walked out uh, uh, onto the sidewalk overlooking the scene, uh, where the bodies were located? Yes, yes. How far would you say you were from where the bodies were located? I was directly above uh, the female victim, which was probably <clears throat> three feet. The male victim would have been uh, 10 feet, 12 feet. All right. And from that vantage point, uh, you first observed uh, the glove that you told us about? Not first, no. When did you first observe it? Uh, we had flashlights. We were looking at the female victim. Uh, we looked at the male victim. Uh, I noticed uh, the glove when I walked around to the... After I exited the residence the first time, I walked around to the side or the north side, north perimeter of the uh, 875 Bundy. There's a uh, iron fence, and through that iron fence, you can get very close to the male victim. And looking there, I could see them down at his feet. All right. The glove was located at the feet of the male victim? Yes. Uh, at the it, foot of at one of the feet. Was it obscured by any sort of plant? There was a, a plant that kind of cascaded over the top of uh, one portion of it, yes. That's why it was easier to see from that location to the north. All right. Uh, we have a, a photo which I will ask to uh, be marked as Defense Exhibit B. All right. 
Does that uh, photo accurately depict uh, the glove at the location where you saw it? To the best of my recollection, yes. All right. And uh, you didn't actually pick the glove up to examine it, did you? Not at that time, no. How far away were you? I mean, what, what's the closest you came to, to examine this glove? At the time, initially at the crime scene? Yes, sir. I'd probably say uh, probably five feet, maybe maybe a little longer than that, maybe, maybe as much as six feet. Well, you indicated you were 10 to 12 feet away from the, from the male victim, and the glove was lying at the feet of the male victim. D did you at some point get closer then? Yes, I went to the, the north residence where that, the victim was almost up against that iron gate that separated the property at 875 to the, the residence townhome to the north. And when you walk on that walkway along that fence, um, that was not part of the crime scene. It didn't appear that there was anything that transpired on that location. You could walk there and get a very good view of the male victim and everything to his uh, east. Now, after uh, Detective Van Hatter arrived, I believe you said that was about 4 a.m.? I believe so, yes. Uh, there was some discussion of proceeding to the residence of Mr. Simpson, is that correct? That's correct. That uh, decision was made uh, within an hour after Detective Van Adder arrived? Yes. And uh, how long after Detective Lang arrived? I'd be within a half hour or thereabouts. And uh, at that time, uh, uh, Detective Phillips had told Van Adder and Lang uh, about uh, the relationship between Mr. Simpson and his former wife? I don't have any knowledge of a discussion about their relationship, no. Were you I, present uh, when Van Adder or Lang were briefed about any of the circumstances uh, of the victim? Yes, but I wasn't there the entire time. I wasn't standing at their side uh, the entire time they were discussing the situation. Well, who made the decision uh, to go and notify Mr. Simpson? I believe it was Detective Van Adder at the direction of uh, Commander Bushy of West Bureau, who... Uh, was uh, concerned that uh, Mr. Simpson wasn't notified of the death by the media or a phone call. He wanted a personal appearance. All right. Now, uh, is this a routine in a homicide case that as soon as you've identified the victim, you uh, notify the next of kin? It's not that immediate um, in all cases, but I think uh, in this case, uh, if it was leaked to the media, I think it would be a pretty insensitive way for our a family member to find out. Certainly. Did you uh, dispatch a patrol car to uh, inform Nicole Brown's parents of her death? I, once I was relieved of the responsibility of the homicide, I didn't direct uh, any units. I was under the direction of Detective Van Adder and Lang. Right. So you're not aware of any procedure on being undertaken to notify the parents of the victim? No, sir, I'm not. Uh, once uh, Mr. Goldman was identified, were detectives sent to break the news to his parents? Like I said, sir, I, I wasn't privileged to knowing of any notifications, and I didn't notify anyone myself. All right. uh, were you aware that uh, Mr. Simpson and his wife were divorced? I think I had heard it, um, only because we work West L.A. And... Well, do you routinely uh, notify the former husband of a homicide victim? I think if there's children involved and we have the children, I think it would probably be the appropriate thing to do. All right, so you are concerned about the disposition of the children as well? Well, I, I believe a lot of the decisions of this came from uh, the commander and Detective Van Adder, and I really wasn't privileged that conversation, but I, I would believe that I would be concerned with uh, the children and uh, the ex-husband since they still had joint custody of the children. I, we had the children at the police station. I think they were somewhat displaced by this at no.